amides contain an amino group, NR2 or NH2 or NHR, linked directly to a carbonyl carbon. And with the amides, we're reaching a carboxylic acid derivative that is very, very unreactive toward nucleophiles generally because the nitrogen of an amide is a great electron donating group, so the carbonyl carbon is not very electrophilic, and NR2 minus, right, the amide anion is a terrible leaving group. And so these two things add up to very low reactivity of amides toward uh, nucleophiles in general. The upside is that because the amine is such a good nucleophile, we can use a variety of carboxylic acid derivatives as starting materials to make amides. So amides can be prepared, for example, from acyl chlorides. This is generally the most efficient approach, and one of these, you might as well choose the most reactive thing to react with an amine to give an amide. Anhydrides also work, and because anhydrides are easier to handle than acyl chlorides in many cases, it's often a good practical choice to go with an anhydride. And we can also use esters, although that tends to be less common than peptide coupling methods, which is another important way to make uh, amides that we'll touch on later in the course in Chem 2312 LS. So we can make amides using acyl chlorides or anhydrides. Reactions of amides nucleophilic substitution reactions of amides anyway are a lot harder to come by. For example, the acid catalyzed hydrolysis of amides is extremely slow um, because the amide carbonyl carbon is not very electrophilic. This has plenty of electron density from that nitrogen that's directly connected to it. But we can get it to go. It works in a pinch, right? We use heat we use strong acid, we use water, something like 6 molar HCl or even concentrated HCl to get that amide to a carboxylic acid like this. And it goes through a mechanism that's analogous to acid catalyzed ester hydrolysis via a tetrahedral intermediate that looks like this and that ultimately eliminates what turns into an ammonium ion by the end of the mechanism. And it's the conversion of the stronger acid H3O plus to the weaker acid for example, NH4+, plus, if we've got an NH2 right here, that drives this reaction and, and really favors the product side. Hydrolysis under basic conditions is even harder than under acidic conditions because of, again, the low electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon. It just does not want to react with nucleophiles. So we can get it to go if we use heat, sodium hydroxide, and we're talking very high concentration of sodium hydroxide there in water, and we need to add acid after that basic treatment because this is necessary to protonate the carboxylate anion that forms under these conditions. Now a third important reaction of amides is their reduction to amines. This is actually an interesting kind of nice way to synthesize amines. If we start with an amide, treatment with lithium aluminum hydride reduces off the carbonyl group completely to a CH2. Similar to carboxylic acids, uh, as we've seen previously, where the carbonyl group is completely gone and replaced with a CH2 group via the addition of two equivalents of hydride to the amide. So lithium aluminum hydride and then work up with water converts an amide into an amine with a CH2 group linked to the amino nitrogen. Nitriles contain the cyano functional group linked to a carbon, and so they have the general structure RCN that you see here. And this carbon is in the plus three oxidation state, making nitriles kind of an honorary member of the carboxylic acid derivatives. They don't have a direct leaving group, potential leaving group connected to the cyanocarbon, but in many ways they are highly analogous to the carboxylic acid derivatives we've already seen, and I encourage you to think of them as, as such. This carbon will react with nucleophiles, for example, in nucleophilic addition processes. Let's turn back the clock a little bit and talk about how we can synthesize nitriles. One of the most important ways to make nitriles makes use of the cyanide anion as a nucleophile in SN2 reactions. So for example, we can start with a primary alkyl halide. Here we have benzyl bromide treatment with potassium cyanide and dimethyl formamide, great solvent for SN2 reactions, gives benzyl cyanide, this product right here. Now, Another way to synthesize nitriles takes advantage of dehydration of amides. If you stare at an amide long enough, you'll realize that the amide has an oxygen and two hydrogens relative to a nitrile. If we could remove the two hydrogens and the oxygen, we would end up with just a carbon and nitrogen left. 
and that's a cyano group that would produce a nitrile. So reagents that promote dehydration, the loss of the elements of water from an amide, a primary amide in particular, with two H's linked to the nitrogen, can produce nitriles. And one reagent that does this, and there are many that do this, but the one we'll highlight here is SOCl2, thionyl chloride. P2O5 is another one that can accomplish this. The basic mechanism here, well first let's talk about the by byproducts. SO2 is a byproduct along with HCl, H+, and Cl-, where the H+, generally gets incorporated into some kind of conjugate acid of a base. Maybe it's the conjugate uh, acid of the solvent, for example. And mechanistically, the basic idea here is that we need to turn the carbonyl oxygen into a good leaving group and deprotonate at this nitrogen twice to generate the nitrile. And so what happens is with loss of H plus and Cl minus, we get this good leaving group established right here. We've actually seen this pattern previously in the reaction of thionyl chloride with carboxylic acids to produce acyl chlorides. It's a good opportunity to revisit that reaction to see the mechanistic parallel here where we installed this same good leaving group in that context. And now what we can do is beta eliminate that good leaving group and this establishes the CN triple bond. The double bond uh, actually came in the elimination of H plus and Cl minus here. Get that triple bond, we do an elimination like this. This generates SO2, that's a gas, and Cl minus. And now to get the neutral nitrile product, well, we just need to lose a proton, right? The solvent could do that or water on workup, something along those lines. And this gives the neutral nitrile product. So the net result is dehydration. And, and notice that the two protons got incorporated into two, into two equivalents of HCl and the oxygen lost got incorporated into SO2 in this reaction. In thinking about the reactions with nitriles, a good place to start is with hydrolysis. It's not the easiest reaction in the world, but it's a reaction type we've seen before. Nitriles can be uh, hydrolyzed under rather vigorous aqueous acidic conditions. First to amides, notice that now what we're doing is adding water back to the nitrile to go from a nitrile to an amide. That is possible if we use heat, water, and acid. And further hydrolysis of the amide under acidic conditions, as we've previously seen, leads to the carboxylic acid. And so where we're really going to focus our attention on this slide is this conversion of the, the nitrile to the amide, because it's, it has uh, some interesting mechanistic sort of quirks to it that are um, not common in other hydrolysis processes. So the, the overall process here corresponds to an acid-catalyzed nucleophilic addition of water to the nitrile group, followed by a process called tautomerization, which converts an isomeric form of the amide into the familiar amide structure with the CO double bond and NH2 group. So first, we start, as we always do under acidic conditions, protonating the basic atom in a polarized pi bond. Here it's a nitrogen rather than an oxygen. This leads to the protonated nitrile, and now water can add in at the nitrile carbon through electron flow like this. This is just a nucleophilic addition step. And once we lose a proton from that water that just added in, we end up at this structure. And notice an H has been added to the nitrile nitrogen, and an OH has been added to the nitrile or cyanocarbon. At this point, the second stage involves essentially moving the proton right here from oxygen to nitrogen, converting the NH to an NH2 and shifting pi bonds around. Electron flow for that looks like this. We first protonate the nitrogen. We've got acid around, we can do that. And then we deprotonate at the OH group and can shift electrons around. This is essentially just resonance type electron flow to get to the anode. This is a process known as tautomerization. We'll have much more to say about it later in the course in the context of ketones and aldehydes primarily. But it occurs here to go from this uh, intermediate to the final amide product. So it does take a, a good bit of juice to get this to go. We need to use heat and quite often long reaction times to hydrolyze nitriles. And once we're at the amide, we can stop there and isolate the amide product, or we can continue using acid uh, and heat to go all the way to the carboxylic acid. And you don't need to show these conditions any differently to show hydrolysis to the amide or carboxylic acid. For example, in a synthesis problem, you can just write H3O plus H2O and heat and write either the amide, if that's what you want, or the carboxylic acid, if that's what you want. Like carboxylic acid derivatives, nitriles undergo reactions with reducing agents, including organometallics like Grignard reagents and organolithiums, but they've got uh, a nice quirk about them 
that allows us to synthesize ketones from nitriles. Recall that previously we saw that acyl chlorides and anhydrides can react with lithium dialkyl cuprates to give ketones. Let's actually back up and take a look at those reactions again to remind us of, of how we can do that. So here's an example um, with an acid anhydride where we treat the acid anhydride with this uh, organo, lithium organocuprate and the result is a ketone. The nitrile opens the door to an alternative way to do this that is, in my experience, easier to remember than this lithium diorganocuprate approach. And the idea there is that we use a Grignard reagent in conjunction with the nitrile. The Grignard reagent adds once to the nitrile or cyanocarbon. And the result here is an imine anion. It looks like an imine, an NH imine, where we deprotonated at that nitrogen to get negative charge. This actually stops here. This does not add a second equivalent of the Grignard reagent like we've seen for other carboxylic acid derivatives. This makes the nitrile unique. And so upon aqueous workup, that N- minus gets protonated, for example, by water. This gives an imine, and we use hydrolysis conditions, for example, acid and water, to convert that imine into a ketone. So this is a really nice way to make a ketone from a nitrile. And the thing that makes it particularly awesome is we know how to make nitriles via SN2 reactions. So this is an extremely flexible way to synthesize ketones with a sort of customizable R group, right? As long as that R group can act as an SN2 electrophile, it's good to go, and a customizable R2 group by changing the nature of the Grignard reagent here. Now, nitriles undergo reduction with lithium aluminum hydride, highly analogous to amides, which give the same product, and carboxylic acids and esters. The final product here is an amine via the addition of two equivalents of hydride. So the first equivalent of hydride adds, we actually get an intermediate that's highly analogous to this intermediate in the Grignard context, just with one of these being H's. That gets protonated, that imine can accept another equivalent of hydride, and after a final proton transfer, we end up with this amine with a CH2 group directly connected to the NH2. Great way to synthesize amines, particularly CH2, NH2. We can install the nitrile, or the cyano group, using an SN2 reaction, and then reduce it from a CN to a CH2, CH2 NH2 group.